Well, good morning, Greenwich, and welcome to the Friday, April 9th edition of the Basement Academy. We love April 9th. We celebrate the birth of our daughter, Bailey, 27 years ago today. And so happy birthday to her. She came yesterday to be with us from Kansas City. And so we get to enjoy the next couple of weeks with Bailey. And so we're excited about that. Uh, to that end, just uh, two administrative notes. One is going to take next week off the Basement Academy to have time with our daughter uh, and enjoy that. And so um, just uh, enjoy enjoy your psalms next week <laughs> and perhaps work back through some of these uh, last several days uh, to continue reflecting on the resurrection. And then we'll pick up again whatever that following Monday is like maybe the 19th or something like that. Um, second administrative note is the webinar uh, for those who are watching uh, the video, not listening, but you can see on the whiteboard uh, on Sunday the 18th, uh, going to have a, a conversation with Alan Ronkin and Sue Stolov, who work with the American Jewish Committee. Um, I've been introduced to them through Cal Hickey, uh, one of our uh, Greenwich Church family, and uh, to talk about the reality of anti-Semitism in the world, and then just more broadly, being people of conscience and how do we stand with one another uh, when we find those, um, I'm not sure what, how to, exactly how to say it, but when people of conscience and people of faith find themselves attacked or persecuted in some way. And so I think there may be some solidarity that we can find. Anyway, I'm, I'm eager for that conversation on the 18th. So that'll be a week from uh, this Sunday. And you can register for that. Uh, and then you'll get the Zoom link. Our, our morning psalm, Psalm 39 this is for the director of music, a psalm of David. I said I will watch my ways and keep my tongue from sin. I will put a muzzle on my mouth as long as the wicked are in my presence. But when I was silent and still, not even saying anything good, my anguish increased. My heart grew hot within me, and as I meditated... The fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. You have made my days a mere handbreadth. The span of my years is as nothing before you. Each man's life is but a breath. Selah. Man is a mere phantom as he goes to and fro. He bustles about, but only in vain. He heaps up wealth, not knowing who will get it. But now, Lord, what do I look for? My hope is in you. Save me from all my transgressions. Do not make me the scorn of fools. I was silent. I would not open my mouth, for you are the one who has done this. Remove your scourge from me. I am overcome by the blow of your hand. You rebuke and discipline men for their sin. You consume their wealth like a moth. Each man is but a breath. Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Be not deaf to my weeping. For I dwell with you as an alien, a stranger, as all my fathers were. Look away from me, that I may rejoice again before I depart and am no more. Psalm 39. And so trying to keep silent, we've all had this experience. I'm just going to hold my tongue. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> and then David... My heart grew hot, and then, then I had to speak. And it's this, it, it's, it's a meditation upon the brevity of life. Show me, O oh Lord, my life's end, the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting is my life. The span of my years is as nothing 
each man's life is but a breath. And then that, that word selah, kind of the pause, reflect, consider. And then again, uh, towards the end of the psalm, you rebuke and discipline men for their sin. You consume their wealth like a moth. Each man is but a breath. That same phrase, our life being but a, a kind of a puff of wind, a breath. And so there's some interaction with the wicked, with the, those who oppose uh, David, some frustration, uh, it seems. And so this is consistent with our lives, right? That's why we love this psalm. It, it speaks for us. It, it gives us language. Sometimes we want to hold our tongue, not say anything about what's going on in our world or what's going on around us or some interaction, but then we have to speak. Uh, we recognize how, how swiftly our lives are today. 27 years ago today, our daughter was born. Where did those 27 years go? Um, and then just the reality, that which we chase after and accumulate, our wealth, it, it, it is consumed like a moth. It's like we, we heap it up, we gather it, and man, just, you know, it just costs money. It is, it's, it, it, it's expensive to live, right? And so uh, it's a wonderful psalm, uh, very thoughtful, uh, pensive in some ways, wistful. So I commend Psalm 39 to you. Okay, another reflection on why the resurrection matters, trying to lean into uh, the Easter experience, allow it not just to be a day, but that it's it's something that shapes our lives. And so I've been arguing for or offering to you that contemplating the, the resurrection, reflecting, recalling the resurrection daily has great value. And so today I want <clears throat> to talk about it, it, the, the resurrection matters because of what it signals. It signifies something. The turn of the ages is upon us. Now that's maybe some different uh, kind of strange language, we find ourselves as Christians often reflecting on the end times. When will the end come? And I've had conversations recently with everything that's going on in our world and particularly in our own nation, the pandemic, some of the political and civil and social unrest, some of the changing uh, moral boundaries, if that's the right, right way to talk about it. Um, the, the ground seems to be shifting uh, under us. And, uh, and I, I've talked to some folks at Greenwich, uh, you know, wondering, are we one tick closer to midnight? You know, is the end uh, near? I've wondered this myself in, in some ways. And so we think there's kind of the, the turn of the ages is out ahead of us. Um, our... Our Jewish friends and rabbinic commentators talk about this age and the age to come. And so dividing the world into kind of two time periods. The, 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 the world as we know it, the world as it's coming to be, this age and the age to come. And so that language, that messianic language, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When Messiah comes, he will usher us into the age that is to come the coming age. And so I would offer to you that in Jesus Christ, in his death and in his resurrection, the turn of the ages has begun. So Eric uh, preached about this recently. <clears throat> the kingdom has already begun. It is not yet consummated or completed. And so this already not yet tension. And so... <clears throat> And so Jesus spoke at the Last Supper, what we call the Lord's Supper, took the cup and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my shed blood. And so the, the first covenant, the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant were initiated or inaugurated through the shedding of blood. Okay, spoke about that recently. And so the the shedding of Jesus' blood signifies that, that new covenant. So, so blood is shed, that the covenant 
um, is executed. It, it begins. So we are, the church is the new covenant community, okay? And so we have a sign of the new covenant, baptism. And so that signifies one's participation in that covenantal relationship, those covenantal realities with, um, with God through, through Jesus Christ. So that's, there's, you know, one aspect of that, okay? So the new covenant, we believe that has happened, a, a sign of the turning of the ages, okay? That which the prophets foretold, Jeremiah, Ezekiel particularly, the time will come when I will make a new covenant with my people, says Jeremiah. So there's that. The Apostle Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. That's that same language. But instead of new covenant, he talks about new creation. Okay? And so there's a somewhat of a foreshadowing that. So we have the creation story in Genesis, and then we have the flood story and spoke recently how the flood of Noah, there's, as it were, he gathers two by two, <clears throat> and then he calls uh, Noah and Noah's family to be fruitful and multiply. There's some echoed language of the garden. So the, the Noah story, kind of this judgment, washing things clean and starting again, that's, that's kind of an image of the new creation, okay? Well, that Noah's story ends up being picked up in the New Testament saying it's foreshadowing baptism, okay? So once again, baptism as a sign of something, a sign of new creation, okay? Um, so there's this, this connection <clears throat> that um, baptism is the sign of the new covenant. Jesus said, um, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I will be with you to the end of the age, okay? So this, I am with you, uh, this, this turning of the age that's, that's unfolding, there is going to be yet a consummation, so I'm not saying this is heaven, <laughs> It's that we're, there's this overlap of this age and the age to come are, are somewhat overlapped <clears throat> and there will be a, a consummation one day when all peoples, all nations, all tribes, all languages are reached. Spoke recently about the commitment of the church to be the most diverse institution, entity on planet earth, racially, ethnically, etc. So <clears throat> uh, the new creation, the new covenant, um, there's language, uh, spoke about this the other day. There's language in the book of Colossians, also in the book of Revelation. Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. So speaking of his resurrection, but it's this anticipation of others who will be born from the dead. Okay, so with the consummation of all things in the resurrection, um, the, the, the general resurrection as we might call it. So... We have these signs, we have these indicators, the cup of the new covenant, baptism as a sign that points backwards to the Noah story, uh, points forward, we're washed clean. There is this, this new creation that is unfolding. Um, there's the language that in the cross of Jesus Christ, he is reconciling all things to himself. And so the, again, the, the, the experience of the new creation of the age to come is reconciliation, that, that God will reconcile and restore the world. And so this has begun in Jesus Christ. Again, not everyone is reconciled yet to God, but there are people from every tribe, language, nation and um, that, that are being reconciled. And by God's grace, we if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been reconciled to God. You are a participant in the new creation. You are a member of the new covenant. And you have been baptized. If you are a believer in Jesus and you have not been baptized, please contact me and we will arrange for your baptism. Okay? 
because baptism is the sign of participation in the new covenant, the sign of participation in the new creation, the sign of participation and joining to this resurrection life of Jesus Christ. Those who are baptized have been joined to Jesus in his death, will be joined to Jesus in, are joined in his resurrection by faith and one day will be raised, okay? So I wanna read from the book of Romans. It's kind of a, there's some nuance and complexity to Paul. It's a very, uh, if you've read the book of Romans, you know that it's a kind of a dense argument. I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that it's just thick, it's meaty, it's robust. So he's talking about the law and its impact. And he, he addresses this issue of, well, gee, if when we sin, God's grace abounds to us through Jesus Christ, why don't we sin even more? And, and he wants to address that. So what shall we, this is Romans 6, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that, so that grace may increase? By no means. So don't give yourself to sin so that, hey, well, I'm, I'm letting God be gracious. So I'm just going to go out and live it up. Okay. By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Hmm. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And so Paul catches this death-resurrection motif in baptism. Initially, baptism all would have been by immersion. Okay, so you go under the water symbolizing being buried, the death, and then you come up out of the waters, there's the resurrection, into the grave, out of the grave, okay? And so Paul says, we therefore were buried with him through baptism into death in order that as, just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So we haven't experienced the bodily resurrection. We haven't died and risen in that sense, but a spiritual death and resurrection. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, so there's the resurrection. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of of righteousness. Okay, so Romans 6. There's a lot going on there. You might want to go read it in whatever translation you, you prefer. He's trying to help us understand that um, for those of us who have been baptized, we have been baptized into the death of Christ. So, so as Christ took our sin upon him, so our, in our baptism, that's, that's our connection. He died in our place, but, but, but that's my connection to it. He died in my place. I have a per, baptism is a personal, intensely personal experience, right? It's tactile. We get wet. Okay, so it's not something that just happens spiritually. There are spiritual realities. It's an outward sign of an inward and invisible grace an in, inward reality that takes place 
through an outward experience. <clears throat> and so I think what Paul's argument's trying to say is since you have been baptized with Christ, his death was your death. You're dead to sin now, okay? Don't let sin reign. And so it, it, he's struggling. He, he's trying to communicate, and we're wrestling with this. We go on living. We haven't yet died physically, but in our faith union with Jesus Christ, we are to consider ourselves dead, dead to that old way of life, dead to that old person, dead to that old covenant, right? He talks before and after this about the law. So we're not under law, but under grace now. Law stirs up sin. The, the law of Moses. You, you go tell a child, hey, don't do that. They start thinking, hmm, I wonder what happens if I do that. <laughs> and we see this. It's not just children. There's something about the boundary, something about the border, something about the prohibition, something about the law that makes people want to break the law, want to explore breaking the law. Okay? Can I get away with it? This is the reality of sin. Sin is my will be done. The law says, no, thy will be done. And my will and thy will collide at the boundary of the law. And there's something in the my will be done. And this is sin. Trespasses to, to, to go into Farmer Jones's yard, you know, or uh, across the fence. That's what trespassing is, right? And so... Baptism is this symbol. There, there, there's, it's rich with symbolism and significance. But the key is baptism is that participatory ritual that signifies that we belong to the new creation, the new covenant, the age to come. Our life is ahead. It's not behind. We don't look back into the old person, the old way of life. We look forward. And so this process of consider yourself dead to sin and consider yourself now alive to God. You have been, you have died with Christ. You are now raised with Christ. Let his resurrection, his life shape and animate your, your words, your thoughts, your actions, how you spend your time, how you spend your money. We spent time talking about that yesterday. Recalling the Resurrection of Jesus Christ can shape our emotional life. It can shape our relationships. It can shape the way we view the future. A sense of hope and freedom and commitment and a life of love and service that we become instruments. And so Paul says, we offer our bodies as instruments of righteousness. So my hands and my, 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 my eyes and my ears, my voice, all of me, I offer now to God. I'm no longer a slave to sin. I'm, I'm, I'm a servant of righteousness, okay? And so baptism is that, that, that turning point. It's a turning point. It's intended to be a turning point in each person's life. Now, our Baptist friends say that's exactly why you only baptize believers, right? When a person is of mature age and judgment and can discern for themselves uh, the, the importance and responsibilities of following Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm not, I'm not going to fight my Baptist friends. I, I don't quarrel with that. My understanding is that this same reality can be expressed in the baptism of children. They're included in the covenant, and then as they mature, it's the sign of God's grace preceding their experience of God's grace. Okay, so... God reaches out to us. We, we love because we, he, he loved us first, right? We love because he first loved us. And so, and I hope, I hope my Baptist friends won't quarrel with me in, in uh, expressing child baptism. And so the key is baptism is the sign of our participation in the resurrection life, in the death and resurrection, in the new age, in the, the, the age to come, the new covenant, um, all of this, this new creation. So the challenge is how do we let our baptism be a living reality? Okay, so one homework assignment 
two homework signs. If you haven't been baptized, please contact me and let's make arrangement for your baptism. If you have been baptized, do you know when you were baptized? Do you know your baptism birthday, as we call it in our house? And so I was baptized on October 9th. This is why we have baptismal certificates. Everybody should have their baptismal certificate, okay? If, if you don't know where your baptismal certificate is, see if you can connect with the church uh, where you understand you were baptized, either as a child or as a believer. We have a baptismal identity, which is an identity belonging to the new creation, to the new covenant. And we're to live into that. That's to be not just something, oh yeah, I was baptized way back there. Yeah, that was a cool thing. Or I don't remember anything because I was baptized as a kid or even as an infant or a child. And so the, the, the baptismal experience of the Christian is not simply that I am a member of the church family. It, it is the sign of entrance. It's the, it's the ritual of entrance into the Christian community. Historically, going back into the earliest church, uh, candidates for baptism would go through a period of instruction for up to two years, and then they would be baptized in the Easter experience. And so this this um, what the, this season that we're upon it, because it would be symbolizing the death and resurrection. So they would be baptized in Easter week. Uh, some traditions continue. Some Christian uh, traditions continue that that practice. We have a much less intentional time of baptismal instruction, though for for ch uh, students we do. Uh, we have our our class of instruction or confirmation class. The, the, the point I, I'm making poorly, I think. So there's a symbolic reality to our participation, the new creation, the washing clean, the Noah story, the, the, uh, the Exodus story is, is symbolized also in baptism, the, wa the water stories, okay? No, the flood, the Exodus, and Jonah, all three of those are captured in Christian baptism, okay? Uh, the, the, the new creation, uh, the judgment and grace, the escape from slavery into freedom, and then the death and resurrection. Jonah goes under the water, he comes up out of the water three days later. And so there's this, this symbolism that, that points for, Jonah points forward to Christ. So there's symbolic reality to baptism, but there's a living reality. That's what I'm trying to get at, the living reality where Paul in this passage, um, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. And so sin is inconsistent with the new creation. Sin is inconsistent with the new covenant. Sin is inconsistent with this new life, this resurrection life. And so that's that tension that Paul's wrestling with. And then he goes a little deeper in, in, in Romans 7. And so, <clears throat> so let me urge you to recall your baptism. Remember your baptismal birthday. Do the research if you don't know that. Okay, ask if you have living family members that can help you with that. Um, but more importantly, it's the living, it's the offering of ourselves daily. We live to Christ. We are, our sin has been put to death. And so, and so sinful habits and patterns and, and ways and, and then actions and words and attitudes, this is inconsistent with who God is making us to be, has made us and is making us to be. And so the baptismal reality is a sanctifying reality. It is a transforming reality that we are to continually consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God, dead to sin, alive to God, dead to sin, alive to God. Uh, the, our forebears, our Puritan forebears talked about mortifying the flesh, putting the deeds of the flesh, that is of the old sinful nature, putting it to death. That while it's true that in Christ uh, we've died to sin, but sin wants to linger, right? 
And so that sin nature is not completely eradicated, okay? We are forgiven, but we are, as Martin Luther said in the, um, kind of in the Protestant Reformation, he said, we are at the same time saints and sinners. Simul justus, simul peccator, peccator being sin. We are at the same moment justified. We are at the same moment a sinner. That tension. And so that tension that we sometimes feel like, I, ah, here I go again. I did it again. God, I'm so sorry. Well, hey, consider yourself dead to that thing. Don't linger in shame and guilt and regret. That, that, that thing has been nailed to the cross. God, thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you for his new power in me. Help me to be attentive. Next time I'm in that situation, Lord, help me not to yield to that old pattern and habit of, you know, talking about people or yelling at people or what, you know, whatever the thing is. And so perhaps we'll talk more about that uh, uh, in in coming days. But I, I want, why the resurrection matters is it, it it's, it, it opens to us this new life. We can live a better life. God wants us. He is leading us into this better life. And it's available to us now. We don't have to wait to heaven to live our best lives, <laughs> to become our best selves. The, and, and so this baptismal reality is what I wanted to kind of lift before you. That every time we baptize a child or an adult at Greenwich, we are once again proclaiming the resurrection, the death and resurrection, and we are proclaiming that this new covenant, this new creation has begun, and we celebrate that. So, Okay, well, let me end here. Uh, hopefully, this has been helpful. Again, it's a, it's a nuanced little, little um, study. Uh, more to say about it, but let's do that on another day. Let's close with prayer. And so we bless you, O Lord for the life that we share in Jesus Christ. Thank you for his death, his resurrection. Thank you for our baptism that we might be joined to him in his death and resurrection. And so help us to live into our new creation, new covenant, new identity as those who are dead to sin and alive to God through Christ. And so release your resurrection power fresh in us. Give us the ability to be attentive to our own hearts and lives and actions. And may we, as Paul uh, instructs, may we consider ourselves dead to that old way of life. And may we offer ourselves afresh as those who are alive to God. And, and so use us this day, uh, body, mind, soul, hands and heart and feet, uh, being servants of Jesus Christ, loving the neighbor in front of us this day. And so we give you thanks for our new life in Christ, in whose name we pray, and who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the God of the new covenant and of new creation and of this new life watch over you, bless you, keep you, and fill you with his power, grace, and truth this day and forevermore. Amen.